A few months ago, Jacob Collier released a video of him playing a 21 against 22 polyrhythm. This is 21 against 22, ready? I enjoyed the video, I love the ridiculousness of it, but I think there's actually a lot that we can learn from learning how to play something like this. And the reason is that the skills required for playing polyrhythms are essentially the same skills that are required for playing music. Polyrhythms are hard, and so if you learn how to play things that are hard and do that well, you can apply those skills to other areas. To begin, we need to talk about our mindset while performing polyrhythms. And the important thing to know here is that performing polyrhythms is not a matter of thinking about two things at once. Now that might seem counterintuitive because it can certainly seem, especially from the audience's perspective, that musicians are multitasking when they're performing polyrhythms. But in fact, we're not able to split our consciousness into multiple streams as if each of our hands had different brains, for example. Instead, everything is controlled centrally, and that means that we need to understand how everything fits together as a whole. Now, the way that we do that in terms of rhythm or coordination is that rather than focusing on many different things at once, we need to understand how they all fit together in the form of a composite rhythm. To really grasp how composite rhythms function, we're going to have to use a little bit of math. But don't worry, I brought candy. Imagine that each m and represents a point in time where we can choose to either place a note or to rest. And let's imagine that these kinder bars represent our bar lines or the first beat of each measure. The distance between these two chocolate bars is 15 m and -Ms. In musical terms, you could think about this as a measure of 1516. Are you with me so far? What? Now, let's imagine that we want to divide this space into five equal parts. We can place one gummy bear at every third M&M. Five times three is 15, and so placing a gummy bear at every third M&M will give us five perfectly spaced gummy bears. Now let's imagine that we also want to divide this space into three equal parts. We can measure it out by placing a green gummy bear at every fifth m and The rhythmic relationship between the red and green gummy bears is a five against three polyrhythm. Notice how you can kind of drift back and forth between hearing the five as your bass time or hearing the three. But notice how you can't hear both time signatures at the same time. Now, of course, we can hear both rhythms at the same time. We can either hear both of them as a function of triplets or both of them as a function of quintuplets. But it's impossible to hold the duality of quintuplets and triplets in our mind at the same time. Therefore, whenever we play polyrhythms, we're always going to have this choice on how to hear it. Using this gummy bear method, we can easily determine how to play any polyrhythm with a high degree of rhythmic accuracy. We can also apply this to our 21 against 22 polyrhythm, but we're gonna need a lot more candy. This pattern is gonna take a lot longer to resolve. Instead of 15 M&Ms, we're gonna need uh, 21 times 22, 462 M&Ms. That's enough M&Ms to stretch from here to the other side of my apartment, and it's more M&Ms than Ben Levin can hold in his pants. That's a lot of M&Ms. But playing this is not impossible. So again, we're gonna to have to choose how to hear this. And we're gonna to have to think about it in either 22 tuplets, meaning 22 notes per quarter note, or as 21 tuplets. I'm gonna try and hear this as 22 tuplets. Basically, I'm gonna be feeling this as if it were 11, eight, and I'm playing 16th notes. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, then dega, 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 dega. My right hand will only play the down beats and the left hand will play every 21st note. The fact that both of these numbers are so close to each other actually ends up helping us and working in our favor in this case. It means that all I have to do is move my left hand one note earlier every bar. So the left hand keeps getting slightly earlier, slightly further away from the right hand hit. And this is gonna take a while for the whole cycle to complete, but that's the idea. In that last example, I was subdividing the beat with my kick drum to sort of help me keep track. But if you wanted to play the true, pure polyrhythm by itself, you would have to count in your head.
As great as this method is, it has definite limitations as far as tempo goes. Your speed limit, in other words, is determined by how fast you can think, how fast you can subdivide these rhythms in your head. And so if you want to play this at a faster tempo, you're going to have to change your approach. I mentioned before that performing polyrhythms was not a matter of thinking about two things at once. This next example is the closest thing that you could get, I think, thinking about two things at once. Let's say you want to play four against five at a reasonably quick tempo. At this tempo, it's too fast to calculate precisely. I can't subdivide the beat in my head fast enough. The best solution is to just really focus on the downbeats. Sort of let the feet go on autopilot and focus on the hands. In other words, I'm focusing mainly on the chocolate bars and just kind of letting the M&Ms fall where they will. But this method also has limitations. You're gonna be limited by what you've practiced and how big of numbers you're used to feeling and combining. Personally, I would have a really hard time playing anything on autopilot that's larger than sevens or maybe nines. It's not to say that it's not possible. Mike Mangini, for instance, used to have a portion of his clinics where he would ask for two numbers from the audience between one and 20 and play one with his hands and one with the feet. And he could do that. He had practiced that. I have not, so I'm gonna have a really hard time playing 21 against 22 in this fashion. So that's another approach that you could take to playing polyrhythms. But again, like the first method, it has its limitations. And we still have not come up with a way to replicate exactly what Jacob Collier did. It seems to me that the way that Jacob Collier is probably thinking about this is more like a series of flams that get progressively further away from each other, like wider, and then in the middle of the cycle, it's like even single strokes. And then on the back side of that rhythm, it would slowly get closer together until you get to the end. And I don't think it would be that hard to learn how to play it. So if I had to bet, I'd say that that's probably how he's thinking about it. That would be my informed opinion on the subject. That's all well and good, but we haven't talked about music yet. What do we do with these rhythms and how do we fit them into music if we should do that at all? As soon as you start getting into bigger numbers, it starts to sound really chaotic and so it becomes harder to make them musical. It doesn't mean that they are unmusical on their own. It's like, I don't know, is the note A unmusical? Not necessarily, it, it depends on how you use it. But that being said, it is more difficult to make this obscure rhythm 21 against 22 sound good. This first example is a little bit odd, no pun intended, but it does kind of work, kind of. The way I decided to phrase this was to break the 22 up into two groups of 11 meaning we have a really slow quarter note that just alternates between kick and snare with 11 notes per beat. That's 22 subdivided notes per measure. And then I wanted to see what it would sound like to accent every 21st note with the ride bell. my ride bell is gonna move one note earlier every measure and make a 22 against 21 polyrhythm against my bass drum. Now I agree you're not gonna play a beat like this on most gigs. It might seem like unnecessarily difficult and like why bother? But that being said, it does have a particular sound, which I kind of like. It's a little bit unpredictable and somehow almost more human or more organic because it's not so locked 
to a grid of four or eight. There was one example I came up with. I probably wouldn't ever do anything with that, but I guess one thing that was cool is that I learned some different ways to play in 11 tuplets, which I hadn't really practiced before. So there definitely are benefits to practicing this kind of stuff, because you never know where it might lead musically, and you never know what skills it might allow you to develop. Anyway, I did have one more musical example that I tried, and this was an ostinato. I didn't have a lot of time to practice this. I noodled around for like 30 minutes trying to figure out how to play some kind of ostinato in 21. It was 21, right? Yeah, basically it's like a bar of 4-4 four, four, and then 5 16th notes. So I took an ostinato I already had some familiarity with in 4-4 four, four, and then added another like 5 16th notes at the end. For the 22 with the hands, I took two 11s and I phrased each 11 as four plus four plus three, or a paradiddle, paradiddle, and right, left, left. And then to make it a 22 note pattern, I had to put two 11s together. And the challenge, of course, is combining the two. I didn't have that much time to practice, so it's a little bit sloppy, but this is what it sounds like. Oh, sorry about that. Here it is. That example would take a lot of work, both on a technical level and on a musical level, to make it sort of palatable, but that is a way that you could do it. It's something that you could insert as like a brief solo moment or as a fill, and that's usually how I end up applying this stuff. So like, for instance, in the Sungazer album, which came out last month, there's a song called Bird on the Wing, where I, I snuck in a very naughty rhythm, which is a 19 against 18, side against side sticking rhythm. But it wasn't something I tried to force in there to be like clever or something. It was actually a pattern that was inspired by the keyboard part. Like, ah, oh, that would be neat if I kind of caught that with the left side. And I just could not resist the idea of throwing a 19 in there just because. Anyway, I'm just saying this because that is one instance where I actually did apply this stuff like literally. It's not the kind of thing you're gonna play on a wedding gig. Please don't do it if you've been hired to play for a single songwriter, but it's better to have the ability than not. So I say go for it, practice the stuff, have fun, be tasteful, and I have one final treat for you. As I was learning how to do the Jacob Collier thing, I realized you could do that with bigger numbers. So um, this is 99 against 100. Thank you guys for watching. I'll see you later. Yeah, this is gonna take a while. Let's read some YouTube comments. Top comment from the last video was, please make this an Adam Neely but for drums channel. I love that. Um, Adam is a good friend of mine. We've played together a lot. I've known him for more than 10 years at this point. And yeah, I really enjoy his videos too. And I like making YouTube videos as well. I didn't know Vsauce was a drummer. Hey, it's Vsauce. We're gonna talk about polyrhythms. Are you related to Steven Crowder? Uh, the Fox News guy, no, but my dad's name is Steve. Hey, Sean, you have the best drum face in the game. Thank you. I practice very hard to get the right drum face. How did you get that snare sound? Trigger the shit out of it. Is this a Dennis Chambers poster? Hell yeah, it is. Looks like the polyrhythm's done. That's all the time we have. Thank you all for watching. You guys know what to do. Go, music. Bye.